Welcome to our first Diplomat Dialogue. Um, we want to welcome everybody that's out there in viewership. Um, we're excited about this program. We're excited to have all of you here live. And those of you that are watching um, as a uh, recorded version, uh, thank you for joining and taking the time to do so. I'm joined this morning. My name is uh, Brenda Hawks. I'm the Senior Manager of Patient Advocacy here at Diplomat. And I'm joined this morning by Jay and by Matt. So just a little bit about me and uh, Diplomat. My job here, as I said, is with patient advocacy. We service patients with uh, cancer as well as chronic and debilitating diseases, including MS, CF, and a whole host of others. Today we're going to concentrate on cancer and cancer survivorship. As many of you may know, June 5th was Cancer Survivor Day. And throughout the month of June, we're concentrating on cancer survivorship and our treatment and care of patients in the cancer um, uh, vicinity. And uh, Jay is here as a cancer survivor to help us understand more of what, what he's been dealing with and what he can help us as we are going forward with our cancer survivorship. And Matt, as a pharmacist, is here to help us understand a little bit more about what Diplomat does for our patients. A little bit more background on me. I am a cancer survivor, a 10-year breast cancer survivor, uh, doing well today. Um, it was a, a hard journey. Um, I live with that idea every day. Um, I do continue to do well. My husband is also a cancer survivor and uh, 14 years now, so he's doing well too. But we do know what cancer can do to a family and to, to us as individuals. Um, uh, so we're using the Google Hangout to host more events like this, so just keep, keep watch for that over time and um, enjoy, enjoy the broadcast. We will take some questions at the end if we have time to do so, I hope we do, and uh, looking forward to hearing some feedback from you as well after the fact. Um, Jay, I want to thank you especially for being here today. It's such a pleasure to have you here at Diplomat. Um, you can tell a little bit more about how we met and uh, your interaction here with Diplomat, but um, I wanted to say what a pleasure it has been to see you, um, <clears throat> to have you here, to have your wife here, Linda, and just to see in person how well you're doing, but to hear your strength and um, uh, encouragement for our team here at Diplomat on, on the care we've helped you with, and, and uh, we'll get to some more unique ideas around survivorship as we go forward in the program. So Jay, if you want to take it over, tell us a little about yourself and a little bit more about um, what brought you here. Glad to be here, Brenda. As Brenda said, my name is Jay. My wife and I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, as far as being diagnosed, I was diagnosed by chance. I went in November 4th in 2006 to have my, my left knee replaced. Uh, 10 years of football, several years riding bareback Bronx, 24 years of walking around on steel submarine decks took its toll, so I thought it was time to get some get some bionic knees. <clears throat> well, I went in uh, the morning of the uh, 4th of November to do the blood test for the anesthesiologist. Went back to work, you know, normal day for me. Well, about three or four hours later, my wife called me. I mean, when I looked at my the, the caller ID on my phone, I I knew something was wrong. Uh, my wife never calls me. Back. That's a, that's taboo in our house. Uh, I answered the phone. She says, "You need to get home." I said, "What's going on?" She says, "You need to get home." I said, okay, so I packaged up and went home. And uh, she broke the news to me. She said that Pam, who was the anesthesiologist, our, our neighbor, had called her and told her I needed to go see a specialist because they found a problem with my blood test. Well, I asked her what the problem was. She says, well, she really didn't elaborate. She didn't know, but you need to go see a specialist. <clears throat> I looked at my wife and said, now they're probably telling me I have leukemia. I didn't know that for a fact at the time, but that was my first thought. Uh, we lived in Wyoming at the time where there's, there's more cows than there are people and very, very few specialized doctors around there. So this oncologist I had to go see, or specialist, was two and a half hours away. Probably the longest two and a half hour car ride I ever took. I mean, I had some, some pretty ugly thoughts going through my mind. Anyway, we got up there and they, they showed us into the our, our little room there, patient room. And 
I felt like I was in a jail cell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've been in jail, so I, I know what it feels like. <laughs> 15 hours and 26 minutes one time. Anyway, the doctor came in and introduced himself. And first of all, first thing out of his mouth, he said, well, I got good news and bad news. I said, well, what's the, what's the good news? And he said, well, if you have to have leukemia, you got the kind you want to have. Well, I kind of thought to myself, who in the heck wants leukemia? You know, I've, three of my three of my best friends died of leukemia. Leukemia kills. That's that's the thought that went through my head right then. He says, uh, and I said, well, what's the, the the really really good news? He said, well, the good news is we'll take a watch and wait approach to this thing. He says it's a very slow slow progressing cancer. We can control it. Uh, Nobody can really forecast how long you'll live, so that's what we did. We watched and waited for for five years till my white blood cell count got up above 100,000, and he decided it was time to do some chemotherapy. <clears throat> well, I didn't wasn't too impressed with chemotherapies. I'd heard a lot of horror stories about that, about the nausea cause, causes, and the hair falling out, and I, I really felt kind of queasy when he brought in this list of prescriptions for me to have filled for anti-nausea. Uh, didn't want to go there. Anyway, we we started into to chemotherapy. And uh, I was on a regimen of, of three days of chemo, three weeks off, three days of chemo, three weeks off for six months. Uh, never lost hair, never got sick, never took any medications. Felt good. I, I was lucky. Uh, Started doing a lot of research into exactly what this chronic lymphocytic leukemia was. <clears throat> and I'm a technical person. I have a technical degree, mechanical engineering and physics. And, uh, actually, to be quite honest with you, the, the technical lingo that was on the internet regarding leukemia absolutely snowed me. I gave up in a hurry. My wife, on the other hand, started doing a lot of research on, on uh, diet and cancer, and we have since drastically changed the way we eat. Uh, I think to this day I'm probably still alive because of my wife. Uh, we eat very healthy, we eat a lot of organic stuff, uh, no processed foods whatsoever, very little red meat. Anyway, we got, we got started on that. Uh, the doctor also told me uh, early on that there was only one cure for my disease, and that's stem cell transplant. But they thought they could probably control it with, with the chemotherapy. So I did the chemo. Uh, after the first round of chemo, uh, we were living in Wyoming at the time. My wife and I decided to, to move to Phoenix. Uh, I was in the field all the time in the oil field. and He was shoveling snow on grass and got tired of it. So we, we moved to Phoenix. You can't shovel sunshine. <laughs> anyway, we, we came down here to Phoenix. And, and I got to meet a new oncologist and first time out with him and of course it's always where do you live, where you been, where you raised, all that type of stuff. Typical military questions. Uh, John Bibb told me or he asked me who my doctor was in Wyoming and I said, well, that was an old guy by the by the name of Dr. Anderson. Well, John looked at me and said, Tom Anderson? I said, yeah, it was Tom Anderson. Well, as it turns out, this this Dr. Tom wrote Dr. John's recommendation to get him into oncology school, and then he was one of his professors. So I, I knew that relationship with Dr. Dr. Bibb was going to be a good one, and it has been a good one, and extremely good. Uh, I saw him for about a year after my first chemo treatment, two years I guess it was, and my white blood cell count started going up again. Uh, it exploded. It went up to over 100,000 in about two months. So. We decided to do another another chemo regimen, and it was some type regimen, three days, three days of chemo, long days, six eight hours, and uh, followed by three weeks off time. <clears throat> we did that, and and I was quite frankly getting getting tired of doing chemotherapy, and I asked him what the alternatives was for my treatments. He said, "Well, stem cell kind of transplant, as you well know." He said, "But they got this new medication coming out that." Uh, He's only been through two phases of, of uh, federal, drug, federal Drug Administration testing. It's supposed to go through three, but they were so impressed with it after two, they they started allowing the public to use it. Uh, I 
got in on using that about a year after my first chemo treatment when we discovered it wasn't going to work. And I've been so impressed with it that uh, words can't explain how impressed I was. And in fact, I started taking it two years ago this month, June. Uh, in December, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brenda. Uh -huh. In December, I, I wrote a, an anonymous email, if you want to call it that, to, to Diplomat. Uh, explaining how impressed I was with this drug, and Brenda was the one who, who responded to that email. Uh, she called me about two weeks after I sent it and, and told me she would like to do a phone interview regarding my treatments. We did the phone interview, and about a week later she called me up and she said, well, I'd like to send a bunch of cameramen out to your place and, and do a, a short on you. So we, we, we acknowledged that and said we could do that. Well, they came to our house about three weeks later and started setting up all this camera equipment and lights and reflectors. And I, I just shook my head and wondered what the heck was going on. Well, to make a long story short, they spent 12 hours there to make a three and a half, three and a half minute clip and enjoyable day. Bunch of good guys. Um, anything else I can add to that, Brenda? Well, I think that you covered it extremely well, Jay, and thank you for, for all of that. Um, and then adjacent to me, we had a, a marketing team behind us, all, both of us, that helped um, put together those videos and, and all of those conversations. So uh, I just want to give kudos to our diplomat team that's also helping us here today with this uh, Google Hangout. Can I give you more kudos? Yeah. One of the things that impressed me most with the diplomat team, uh, and uh, there's a couple things. The first thing that impressed me the most is I don't ever have to worry about getting a refill. Uh, they track it for me. They call me when I when I have a refill due. Uh, they always ask me about side effects. Am I having any? Do I need to talk to a, a pharmacist about anything? Uh, I never have to remember anything. It just it's all all an automatic. It's been they've just been super. I, I'm so impressed with the diplomat team. It's it's unbelievable. And then this morning, the response we got from that uh, that meeting we had this morning was just, you know, I've been here for three or four hours, and I feel like I'm part of the family already. It's well, just, well, Jay, you're certainly part of the family, and we want you to know that. As well as all of our patients, we try to treat them like family. And, and I think you're, uh, you're saying the things that so many of our patients feel when we do talk to them on the phone or when we do take care of making sure they have their medications. Uh, on time and, and can help um, mitigate some of those side effects that may happen with, with medications that, that are, can be harsh at times and, and may not be dependent on, on the medication that they're taking. Um, one question for you uh, quickly is how did you and your doctor decide on Diplomat? How, do you, um, how did you come to Diplomat? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how he found out about Diplomat. I know that he read about the, the drugs in, in doing some of his uh, continuing studies in oncology. Uh, how they found out about Diplomat, I can't answer that. I don't know. I'm glad they did. I will say that much. Uh, three things, and I attribute three things to keeping me alive. One of them is Diplomat, of course, and, and the drugs they give me. Uh, the other one is exercise, and the third one is diet, uh, mm -hmm. thanks to my wife. Uh, I skipped over in, in my little talk here a little bit ago. I, I'm a very avid bike rider. I ride my bike 10 miles every day. I go to the gym three days a week. I eat right, and I do my drugs like I'm supposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, those three things keep me alive. Which one is the most important? I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I'm not going to stop any one of the three to try to figure it out. So. Uh, all three of them work together, I'm sure. Uh, they all play an equal, equally important part in, in keeping me going. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoy working with the diplomat people. It's just it's been very pleasurable. Well, Jay, thank you. And, and again, we, we enjoy you as well. Um, I think that you touched on a point. Uh, as a survivor and, and myself being a survivor and going through treatment, um, we know that every cancer survivor, every person with a disease or illness has a unique story and a unique uh, treatment plan, unique um, surroundings. And so at Diplomat, we do try to individualize our, our conversations and our treatment and our care um, as best we can 
to each patient's needs. Um, so that's why I think that we've helped be, you and, and, and your wife be successful with your care. Uh, obviously the diet and the exercise help. I think um, all of us, no matter where we are, whether we're a cancer survivor or not, could utilize some, some good health care uh, around ourselves with, with diet and, and exercise. But um, kudos to you for that bike riding. You're encouraging me every second I talk to you to, to get out and do something, maybe walk the dogs or um, do, do a little bit more for myself as well. So um, Matt, I want to jump over to you. You're a pharmacist here at Diplomat. Will you tell us a little bit more about that, what it means, and what you do here on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, you bet. So uh, I joined Diplomat about three years ago, um, came on as a staff pharmacist at our clinical help desk. Um, what the clinical help desk is is a, is a team of, of nurses, um, pharmacists, and technicians also that uh, are pr primarily involved with patient care every day. Um, so we are, uh, you know, verifying physician and patient orders, uh, making sure those are shipped appropriately. Um, and then we're also, in probably, probably the most beneficial, one of the most beneficial aspects of our job is, is we're counseling our patients. So um, as Jay had spoken about earlier, when our, when our patient care coordinators are setting up delivery, um, they're kind of putting out the initial feelers for us as far as how the patients are doing. Um, should there be an issue there that, that needs to be addressed? Um, that patient care coordinator can uh, transfer that patient over to the clinical help desk. Um, and, and we're going to try to try to help the patient along. So, um, you know, not everybody has side effects, but unfortunately in the, in the nature of our business, a lot of people do. So um, we can give them tips to help manage things like that. Um, we can give them uh, techniques to help them stay on therapy to make their regimens most, uh, most beneficial. Um, and then we can also act, you know, kind of as a facilitator with their physician as well. So when we learn of, um, you know, something may not be going as expected, um, we take care of the things we can on our end, and then we make sure that we follow up with the office to, um, to bring the doctor up to speed on, on what's happening there. So um, we can allow for the most amount of flexibility to, to tailor what the patient needs. So I, I think, Matt, that that really sums up a lot about what we do here at Diplomat. One of the things that I'm most um, happy to be able to tell patients when I meet them in, in the public or even talk with uh, uh, professionals and, and providers across the country is that we do have a 24-7 um, clinical care help desk, which means that our patients, when they're on these medications and they're afraid because they have these chronic, debilitating, maybe cancers, um, they are taking a medication that can be life-saving, life-extending, but it can also have some side effects. So my, one of the things I like best is that I can tell them we're here for you. Uh, we have a 24-7 hotline and that we can help um, anytime you call us and maybe we can work with a provider, work with your doctor, and you don't have to go to the hospital. You don't have to go to the doctor's office. We can help you take care of it at home. and. Um, do you see that happening quite often, Matt? Yeah, that is a, a service that we offer, which has proved to be, you know, quite beneficial for mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Um, so whether you have an issue at nine in the morning or uh, three thirty in the morning, um, there's going to be somebody there to kind of guide you through what the next appropriate steps are should action need to be taken. So, um, if nothing else, just to have that peace of mind um, that we can relay to our patients. Um, and then follow up, you know, as soon as we're able to with offices too, um, just to kind of keep those lines of communication open, which is of dire importance. Right, right. So if we go back to the beginning and just consider a little bit about specialty pharmacy and the difference between retail and specialty, um, you know, you can get your prescriptions filled at a retail store. Some medications can't come from there, and that's why Jay is one of our patients at Diplomat. His medication has to come through a specialty pharmacy. There's a reasons for that. The FDA and the pharmaceutical companies have, have agreed that this is the best course of action for getting the medication to those patients. And we're one of those specialty pharmacies. Doctors know about us because they, they either have been in um, the process of uh, working with these drugs for a long time with these patients, or they're new to the field and we have teammates that go out and help train them and, and their understanding of specialty pharmacy. So these meds 
Um, don't come from your corner drugstore. That's why having a specialty pharmacy is so important and why we do so much work on the phone every day advocating for our patients, making sure they understand what's going on, making sure they can afford their medications, making sure that uh, if there's a copay that we can help um, find funding for them if they need that. And so I think that goes toward relieving the stress on a cancer patient, especially in this case, uh, relieving some of the burden on the caregiver because they're not left with just um, another what do I do situation. And that's where Diplomat steps in and just says, look, we're going to help you. We're going to take care of this and we're going to get you through it. So Jay, did you feel like that was part of your experience with Diplomat? Uh, yeah, I did. I, you know, from, from day one, I felt like like I had Diplomat in my hip pocket, sort of any other way to put it. I mean, I knew they were there. I knew in the back of my mind that I could call anytime I needed to if I had a problem. Uh, I knew I had their support, and that's that's important, very important. So, and then Matt, um, as far as some of our patients that might be listening and, and survivors, um, um, and, and also caregivers, I know, and, and maybe advocacy groups that are online and providers and um, others, what would you tell them um, from a pharmacist standpoint um, that what kind of but Matt, what kind of advice would you give uh, as a whole? You know, as a whole, uh, the most important advice I could probably give is to keep those lines of communication open. Um, quite often with these treatments, uh, you know, we've kind of got to kind of adjust things on the fly. Um, I wish everybody was a cookie cutter and I could say that this medication is going to work the same for everybody. Um, unfortunately, that's just not the case. Uh, the key is to make sure that, uh, you know, Patients and caregivers are staying involved um, with the prescriber um, and quite frankly staying involved with us because we can help facilitate some of that communication as well. Um, so keeping the lines of communication open um, is probably the biggest um, piece of advice that I can get because, um, you know, there's, there's a standardized therapy, um, but also there's, there's some wiggle room too. So we can, we can adjust doses. Uh, doses can be lowered. Um, rest treatments uh, or rest periods can be extended or contracted um, based on patient response. So um, the better patients and caregivers can keep their doctor up to speed on what's going on, um, the more doctor can kind of fine tune that treatment to make it the most effective for the patient. Right. I think that that's really a good advice and I think that you just, just hit the nail on the head there, Matt, because it is important, and we as the pharmacist can be that liaison between the patient and that provider. Sometimes we have a direct line that we can, can get a better response or a quicker response for the patient um, and work with them to, to set that dosing uh, where it needs to be um, for that particular and unique patient. Um, I, I, I can't agree with you more on that. I think that's, a, that's really good. And then, um, Jay, on your end, as a survivor, what would you... Um, what kind of advice would you give to other people coming through this and you're 10 years out from your diagnosis like I am, what kind of advice, if you think back on it, would you give to somebody that was just diagnosed um, about cancer and, and what, do I, what do you do now? I think the most important advice I could give Brenda was don't give up. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, when they hear the word cancer, they just, you know, they, they know they're done for and they give up. Uh, I'm fortunate. I can put it out of my mind. The only time I think about having cancer is when I, I take my medications every morning or when Diplomat calls me. Mm -hmm. My cancer is not de de debilitating, fortunately. Uh, I don't dwell on it, and, and that helps. Uh, but the biggest thing is don't give up. Uh, I know cancer patients see their doctors frequently. Uh, my wife and I, if we have questions, you know, we think about questions, we write those down prior to going in to see the doctor so that we remember to ask questions when we get in there. And I think that's, that's a key part of it. Uh, ask your doctor questions. You know, ask him about new treatments. Ask him about research that's going on. Uh, Get on the computer and research your, your particular cancer. You just type in the keyword, your, your cancer, whatever it is, and you'll be, you'll be amazed at the amount of information that's out there. And don't be like me and quit when the, when the technical lingo 
it's too hard to understand. Uh, keep looking. There, there's stuff out there for you to read that you can understand. Uh, it talks about research and what research is being done and what alternative uh, medications and pathways there are. Uh, you, you'd be surprised at how many, how big a variety of treatments you have for one particular type of cancer. Mm -hmm. If one treatment doesn't work, try something else. Keep trying. Don't take no for an answer. I think that's the biggest thing in my point. I, I couldn't agree with you more, Jay. And, and looking back on it, I know that I was afraid. My husband was afraid. And we did. We, we pushed forward. It was tough. It was tough on, the, on all of us, like I said. But uh, today we're living full lives. Um, cancer's part of us. It's never going to go away. And, and it's there as a shadow, maybe. Um, but it certainly doesn't... Um, it doesn't control our lives anymore, and I'm hopeful that there are more and more patients that are on these life-sustaining medications that can look at their life that way. I live life with cancer. I'm not living life as a cancer patient, right. and I think that that's really important. Um, but speaking of new research and new things coming down the pipeline, Matt, have you got any news for us in that? What can you tell us that you see coming and, and, and expectations of new uh, for cancer patients. Sure, right. So, uh, like Jay talked about, his his initial regimen was um, trips to to an infusion center, to a hospital, um, for like Jay said, three days and then three weeks off. So, um, and the and even though Jay said he didn't experience a lot of side effects, um, unfortunately, that's not the case for everybody. So. Um, not only are, are these regimens, you know, a little complicated, they're a little disruptive um, to your normal life. Um, they have some of these, some of these tag-alongs with them as well. So, moving forward, um, what the, the the medical community is trying to do is, is try to make these therapies a little more targeted. So, um, using CLL for example, um, CLL is a result of of our body just cranking out these white blood cells that that aren't normal, they're not functional, they're abnormal. And they crowd out some of our other cells um, so that they're not as effective as well. So um, what uh, some of the recent medications on the market do um, is kind of are a little more selective um, for this kind of cell. So uh, for example they may uh, inhibit some of the proteins that are naturally available in our body um, that are associated with with tumor and cancer cell growth. Kind of shuts that system down so um, those things can't happen. Um, it may sometimes cancer grows a little better um, in certain areas of our body so some of these medications stop those cells from getting to that part of the body um, where they have a chance to grow and be more successful so it kind of shuts them. Um, what's coming down the pike is uh, you know actually trying to get our own immune systems a little more involved so we have um, medications that are kind of you can think of it as kind of supercharging our immune system to find these cells that are abnormal non-functioning um, and using our own good immune cells, the good white blood cells, to kind of help uh, attack and eliminate those. Um, there's medications in the pipeline that are going to be used in conjunction um, with, with standard chemotherapy uh, to two things. A, hopefully make them more successful, um, maybe make our trips to the infusion centers less common, and, and a key part of that is, is maybe make our side effects less. Um, there's drugs experiments in the pipeline um, that have where these medications almost act as like a toxin. Uh, the catch there is they're not a toxin for all of our cells. We, we want to leave the normal healthy functioning cells alone, but they have a way of migrating to these cells that are not, uh, that are not functioning well, that are abnormal and causing us all these other problems. Um, and they have a way to, to kind of latch onto those cells while leaving the normal cells of our immune system healthy and functioning and, and ultimately doing, doing their job. So, um, you know, the goal with these pipeline agents is, is let's make it more successful, um, let's get more sustained responses, and uh, let's try to limit some of the side effects um, that are traditionally associated with, with these regimens. Right, Matt, and that's what I've been hearing as well. And, it, and as for those of you that don't know, pipeline is all of the drugs that are coming through clinical trials, through process, through phase one, two, and three, through our uh, manufacturers and, um, and research institutes across the country. And so we call that the pipeline. We look at those drugs um, as a whole and the ones that would fit in uh, with our um, patient base that we need to certainly have 
for our patients to have access to. Um, one other thing I'd like to share before we sort of wrap up here is this past weekend I was fortunate I went to the uh, ASCO meeting which was in Chicago it's the largest uh, oncology meeting in the country it uh, was over maybe 50,000 people researchers um, doctors um, advocates groups that support cancer patients across the country um, and the underlying theme is always the patient always what can we do to help the patient what can we how can we work together to make the patient's path better how can we work as uh, together to bring these drugs to market how can we help solve the problem of cancer and while I know that we're all looking for a cure that we all want the cure I, I want you to know that there's hope and uh, I always get teared up on this but uh, there's hope and there's a lot to be thankful for and a lot of people out there working for us, working for us every day as survivors and for those of us that may be facing a cancer diagnosis. So Jay, if you want to just um, end up with a couple of words and then Matt will go to you. I, I think the key, you hit the, the nail on the head there Brenda, there's always hope. Uh, if you don't have hope, you, you might as well pack it in. I, I, I mean, seriously. Uh, there's always something coming around the corner tomorrow. Uh, they've made so many strides in, in, in cancer cures, cancer mitigation, and just in the last five years, uh, it, it's phenomenal. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how anyone oncologist keeps up with it all, but they do a pretty good job. And, and like I said before, perseverance. Keep after it. Keep asking questions. Keep tackling it. Don't give up. Just uh, that's the biggie. Don't give up. Don't. No. Part of that, I, I I can't think of much else to add to that. I think you did beautifully, Jay. What about you, Matt? Just any last words? Yeah, you know, uh, just to kind of echo what you and, and Jay said, we we have the silver bullet yet, but there's um, there's plenty of people that are trying to address the problem. So, um, and Jay is right. In the, in the past five years, what was available to to patients is uh, those those options have grown significantly, and and the good news is that we're seeing some some decent results with those. So, um, very important. Um, just uh, you know, from a diplomat perspective, um, I always. Uh, kind of figure that the, the patients have enough to worry about so let us take care of some of the other things um, to kind of to kind of help you along if we can if we can take away one of those stresses um, then that's a little more energy you have to, to keep going with um, what you need to do to, to make yourself uh, as well as you can be <laughs> that's exactly right Matt thank you so much so I'd like to just wrap up uh, today's Google uh, hangout our diplomat dialogue I'd like to invite you to pay attention and, and check our website uh, for future dialogues. Um, I know we'll have some more coming. Again, this is uh, June. We're, we're concentrating on oncology and cancer survivorship, um, but we also handle a lot of other disease states. If you don't know Diplomat, check us out on our website, diplomat.is, and if you want somebody to come and talk to you at your practice, at your advocacy group, at your um, get your meeting, or even just uh, a patient that's looking for some help, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to us. Um, we, uh, like I said, you can just go to our website. You can find us through there, and uh, diplomat.is. And we look forward to hearing back from you. We hope you enjoyed today's um, dialogue, and we look forward to having you back again in a future dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>